Happy Exodus, everyone. Have a blessed unleavened bread and Passover week. This is a special video with some special research that's near and dear to our hearts here, and we wanted to share this with you, uh, especially today of all days. No, uh, not unholy week of the Catholic Church. Yes, that is sometimes close in dates, but many years, you know, it's not. But regardless, they forgot Passover and unleavened bread and the Sabbath. So regardless, they're not keeping these right, even if their dates did in fact match, and they don't really, not typically. Uh, today, uh, basically, this upload is during the daytime here. Uh, of what is Abib 15 on the calendar that we've been following. Again, it doesn't matter to us which calendar you use. We don't know that there is a perfect one right now. Maybe there is somewhere. I know a lot of people have sent us uh, different ones, and we've been making our way through different ones. We haven't seen one yet, but who knows? Maybe somebody got it, and we hope that they do. We hope they beat us to it because they'd be doing a lot of research for us. That'd be good. But the big question is, why does this daytime period matter? Not Passover. Passover ended at sun, sunrise. Why is this it's still the first day of unleavened bread? Why does this period matter? Oh, this is extremely important. Some of the most significant events in all of history. Yep, this is the day, not last night, right? Uh, which was Passover uh, uh, up until sunrise. Not only that, this is one of the most significant days in all of time. How about that? No doubt Passover is incredibly important, and we certainly aren't demeaning that in any sense, any way, shape, or form. We teach the Passover, of course. But this is the second half of the first day of unleavened bread. Remember, it goes from sundown to sundown. Not the rule, but the exception to the Bible day, which still begins at sunrise. And not only does this not change it, this tells you that it it's exactly that. Uh, when we use the right calendar, of course, that's the way this works. When we don't, we have a gray area, actually, that's created by the Pharisees in here. And right now, we're kind of in oblivion. There's really no purpose for this part of the day because they're waiting for their Sabbath to begin when it already began last night see that's a problem and it goes for a full day uh and it can't skip and and this is this is the challenge that you even find in the new testament because you see two calendars at work and we have to reconcile those to figure out which one they're talking about when luke's talking about especially narratives of the pharisees he's using their calendar because that's the way they speak in terms of that's what they're following and then when he talks about Mary, he's talking about the Bible calendar. You can't look at the two as the same thing. You must reconcile what is going on and which calendar is being used here because there's two at play there, not to mention the Roman one, which is a whole nother thing. So, which is what the Catholic Church does, which is, I mean, so they don't understand any of it because they profane all of it just as the Pharisees do. Uh, this proves that the date changes at sunrise, actually, by the dates, uh, and we'll show you that just briefly in this video, though that's not what this video is about. Passover itself ended at sunrise this morning. Again, the day of this upload on the calendar we use, uh, which, again, is not perfect, and we certainly have said so I don't know how many hundreds of times now. But today is still a feast Sabbath. It's the second half of the feast Sabbath. We're still in a Sabbath here. Again, a feast Sabbath. Still the same day. In fact, the self-same day is what Scripture says uh, in terms of this feast, uh, which began at sundown last night, Passover. But the first day of unleavened bread is a full 24-hour day. Passover is not. It's just the first half of it. So why is this part of the day so super significant. In fact, that it's listed above Passover in terms of such as one of the three holiest days of the year. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. So why not Passover? Why doesn't it say just say Passover there if it's just Passover? Because it's not just Passover. Yes, partly because Passover is included 
in this first day of unleavened bread. It's the first half of it. But now we're in the second half, and this ain't no lightweight, folks. This is just as important uh, as last night. It wasn't just last night only. The continuation is massively huge. But after this video, you'll see this, and you'll know this. It is far more than just Passover. Uh, three of the most significant events in all of history, in fact, we're going to cover it in a second, uh, happened on this day, uh, and not on Passover, actually. Passover was over when they each happened, uh, occur. This is forgotten, again, because when one follows the lunar calendar, this is a gray area where you're waiting for the feast sabbath to begin even though it began last night uh and is already in progress see that's the problem with their calendar they have to add to which adding to is what they do that's called leaven so they're they're actually adding leaven to the days of unleavened bread can you be more grossly negligent than that and the calendar completely ruined in understanding uh when you follow the lunar calendar and we've well proven that no one will ever reconcile that to the Bible because, well, it's just wrong. Uh, this period is not really considered anything to them, yet it is to Yahuwah. And we know this because we have three massively significant dates here, uh, or events on this date. On the first day of unleavened bread, during the daytime, now, uh, still, according to its calendar, and still on a feast Sabbath here, and we still congregate this day, by the way. We, we should be doing that still. It wasn't just last night. It's also today that we congregate, not necessarily to feast, although you can, um, but just to get together and worship together. Uh, let's establish, though, this timeline firmly so everyone can restore the meaning of this part of this day that can never be forgotten and you won't want to forget it ever again after this video let us not forget again there are three feasts that the bible says require a pilgrimage uh, to return to israel uh, to keep each year again that's the old testament uh, and uh, by the way it's also in the new testament they're still doing that there uh, but it's just those three of the seven feasts why why these three? Why are these three so significant? And notice, well, Passover is not listed here. Not specifically, not by itself. Uh, not even the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, which is an incredibly significant day, no doubt, but not one of the big three. See, these were the first day, specifically the first and all of it, a full day of unleavened bread, not just Passover. This alone actually serves to prove the day cannot begin at sunset because the Jewish Babylonian calendar screws this up royally and skips this period. They have a half a day and then start the Sabbath and they miss the half of the Sabbath and the other half of the Sabbath. They miss the whole Sabbath, basically, uh, the feast Sabbath of this uh, observance. Then there is Shavuot, which is the day of covenant renewal when Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Israel, all renewed covenant with Yahuwah, and it is the day Isaac was born, which is the same day Yahushua was born, never in December, but in June, roughly. Watch our Restoration of Shavuot video. It's amazing, as well as uh, we have a whole series, When Was Jesus Born? Uh, check it out. It's worthy of review. It is very sad that scholars from supposedly his church uh, forgot this when it's right there so well preserved, especially by Luke, who many scholars call, uh, you know, accuse of, of having discrepancies. Luke just didn't understand. I mean, how dumb can they be? Uh, Luke understood. You, scholar, do not. That's the problem. Uh, you can't read and you need to learn how to. That's, yeah, that's the issue. The final of the three travel feasts is Tabernacles, or Sukkot, uh, in Hebrew, which has massive significance, as that is when the future second coming, New Jerusalem comes down to earth and we receive our new glorified bodies or tabernacles. New Jerusalem, of course, also a tabernacle of sort. Uh, I mean, look at the company that this first day, the whole day of unleavened bread keeps here. 
Wow. Yahusha's birth, uh, when covenant was renewed historically in some of the largest events of the Bible, and then tabernacles, when the new beginning starts after the final judgment, uh, the second coming. Wow! I, I just, I mean, this is amazing. But why the first day of unleavened bread? Well, these have Yahusha's fingerprints all over them, and since he did not pass away, well, neither can they. Uh, and since especially tabernacles, uh, trumpets, and atonement haven't even happened yet, uh, how exactly can they pass away before those events even occur? Hmm? I, it, the church really has this so backwards and so very wrong. We prove this in our feast series. Watch it. Uh, we'll cover a few passages from the New Testament even uh, at the end and prove that the apostles were most certainly keeping this feast after Yahushua ascended even. So no, his resurrection did not change this calendar uh, and practice. It entrenched it firmly. Any church worshiping other festivals of pagan origin uh, is not following the practice of the apostles nor Messiah. That's just fact, Bible fact, indisputably so. Again, Passover is part of this day, half of this day. Uh, but what is forgotten again, is this time period of daytime that we're in right now because, well, the rabbis skip it and forget it, and the church, well, they're clueless about uh, anything in the Old Testament mostly, but especially the feasts and the Sabbaths, and they have been since long, long ago. Now, this is Deuteronomy 16:16. 16, 16. The males of the household were to come to Jerusalem these three times of the year for worship. Three times, just three of the feasts were travel feasts where you come to Jerusalem. Why? Because the temple is there. Understand the temple with the Holy of Holies stood. That's Yahuwah's presence, physical presence, was in Israel at that time. But that was very temporary. It was just a temporary period. Understand that Abraham sacrificed and kept the feast uh, that preceded Moses, as there are some, and Tabernacles is one of those, Shavuot is another, and likely that unleavened bread is the other, though we, we don't know for certain. Um, uh, that's, you know, this is not cataloged that way. Um, and uh, could, could be the first fruit offering because Abel uh, and, and, well, Cain sort of, though, uh, it was profane, uh, they were offering what appears to have been a first fruit offering, um, you know, at the time where Cain then turned on Abel and killed him. But Noah was keeping these, right? So uh, it, the, the ancient, ancient ones uh, that precede Moses. Uh, Abraham was keeping these. So why would we ever look at them as passing away especially under the understanding that the law of Moses passed away, which can't pass away, according to Messiah, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Think not, right? That's what he says. Think not. So let's not think that, okay? The temple was already defiled in 165 BC. It had no real role after that, uh, and the Holy of Holies was never even in the second temple either. Yes, it was the center of worship in Israel, but didn't house the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. Um, today, uh, but once it was profaned and defiled in 165 BC, it really had very little value from then on uh, because it was defiled. Today, we don't need a temple to keep these. And traveling to Jerusalem, a defiled land once again in this age, a spiritual Sodom in Egypt uh, in Revelation 11, uh, that's a vain attempt. There's really no need to go there for anything, for that matter. Uh, in fact, if you want to keep this feast in the land of the Holy of Holies, well, find the true original Holy of Holies uh, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that location can be found. Uh, and keep it near there. That's what we should do. Watch our Garden of Eden series as we do locate that in the modern Philippines. Indisputably so, no one has been able to disprove it in over six years now. And just because they say it louder and louder, uh, nuh-uh doesn't mean that they actually prove anything or disprove anything. They don't, they can't. There's no possible way. Um, anyway. Here's 2 Chronicles 8.13 after the temple is built. 
We see the big three feasts, unleavened bread, which includes Passover. But notice it calls out unleavened bread yet again, and for a reason, a huge reason we're about to get to. Shavuot and Tabernacles, the three. Why is this so important to spell out unleavened bread instead of just trying, just saying Passover? Well, it is far more significant than just Passover by itself. That's important to understand. Again, Passover is awesome. Can't be demeaned. We would never do so, nor marginalize it. We teach it. Uh, we never would do such, and Scripture certainly doesn't. But let's find out why is the first day of unleavened bread, especially that second half during the daytime right now, why is this so important? Yes, the Bible says many times over, but here's an example. Passover is the first half of the first day of unleavened bread, period. Indeed, well identified in many scriptures. Uh, here's, again, one example from Mark, uh, from the New Testament, 1412. Yes, Messiah and his disciples kept the feasts, as the Bible always does, and always will, actually. Even Shavuot's origin is creation, kept by Adam, Noah, and Abraham. Uh, thus, this is not just the law of Moses, but precedes it in some cases. Uh, no one can, nor ever did, abolish the law of Moses. Uh, again, read Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Said Messiah, if you believe him, of course, rather than your pastor uh, and the scholars he listens to but fails to test, well, that's up to you. Uh, when they disagree with Yahusha, they don't have a position of debate. They have a defiled worship. That's what it is. Uh, there's no separating Passover and unleavened bread. Uh, yes, they are counted as two feasts, uh, but one is within the other in all of Scripture. Not rare to Scripture, in fact. Th things such as the Garden of Eden, which houses the Mount of the East within so the two are one location, but they're listed separately as two holy places of Yahuwah. Notice in this passage, Yahushua forgot he wasn't going to eat the Passover, I guess. Yet, Scripture says he did. And he forgot to correct the disciples that, well, it wasn't the Passover yet, uh, even though they said it was. And he certainly seems to agree since he tells them, yeah, go get the Passover lamb and prepare it. Uh, many scholars propagate that, and simply, they can't read. That's all it is to it. Uh, there really is no other way to put it. Uh, if you hear these things, test them. You can figure it out for yourself, uh, though most scholars really struggle with such because they're programmed very deeply into a box they just simply can't see outside of. And many pastors are there, too. Exodus 12, many read this last night. It is the Passover account in full. Uh, but, and there's other passages too, of course, but that's our, our favorite. It's, it's the uh, one of the better. But within this is the seven days of unleavened bread, well-defined as beginning of Beeb 14 at sundown, which is also Passover. Okay, the two start at the same time. And that's why Passover includes unleavened bread uh, in the meal. Uh, and it goes through Abib 21 at sundown, exactly seven total days, not seven and a half, not eight, not six and a half, okay? Seven, that's it. Even Ezekiel 45, 21 defines this as the Passover the same, because that is within the seven days of unleavened bread included. There is no different count, and they cannot be separated. But why is the whole first day all of it, including this daytime period we're in right now, uh, essentially today, uh, the day after Passover, so important. Oh, it is. Let's remember, too, for those who will say, well, this timing was impossible, as if Israel got caught off guard, and, you know, because Israel was just so large, it would have taken time for them to prepare, so they, they wouldn't have been prepared, they couldn't have left so quickly. Actually, that's a complete misrepresentation of Scripture when they do so. It just proves that they don't bother to actually read the account. Exodus 12, 11 tells us very clearly, Moses already informed the people to begin getting ready to journey, even before they ate the Passover. They knew this was their last night in Egypt. 
They already knew. They were already prepared. This was not a mystery. They were to eat the Passover, ready to go, ready to journey, with their loins girded, their walking shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand. They ate it ready to go in haste, it says. This isn't a mystery. Uh, this was not a laid-back time. It was a massive miracle underway. They knew the gravity of this. Of course, that's the Passover. But let's establish the timeline here, okay? They did not kill the Passover lamb until sundown, right? That's the edict throughout the Scripture. Very clear. You don't kill the Passover until the sun goes down. So, about 6 p.m., roughly, okay? They roasted it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread because Passover is during unleavened bread. The dates are really not up for debate. Uh, we just read it to you. Uh, the Bible says so. No one can frame this as, how could Moses get all those people ready in the dark hours of the morning? Well, again, that's not actually a question. It's just called willing ignorance on the part of those scholars uh, that ask such, well, really stupid questions because they should already know the answer, if they could read, of course. In Exodus 12, 17, uh, it's very clear Israel left Egypt the self-same day during unleavened bread. During the evening, no. They did not leave during Passover. Passover had to end first. They were to observe that to sunrise, making sure the lamb, in fact, had no remains. Uh, and much happened that night. We'll cover this. In verse 29, it was midnight. We're looking for timestamps here. That's what we're doing. Read the whole passage. Read it all. Again, most probably read this last night uh, for Passover. But read it again. It is powerful. What an amazing story. Uh, it was midnight that the angel of death came uh, and killed the firstborn of Egypt uh, of those homes that did not place the blood on their doorposts. Bear in mind, there were Egyptians that did do so and were spared. And some of them left with Israel, in fact. Uh, verse 30, Pharaoh rose up in the night. Uh, then Moses and Aaron, and that would be after midnight, of course, because the angel of death did his thing starting at midnight. So that kicks off the time clock here. So we know we're somewhere in the middle of the night there, in the dark hour still, not morning. Then Moses and Aaron were called to the palace at night, uh, and Pharaoh finally let Israel go in declaration. How long would it take Moses to then get Israel ready at that point? They were already ready. The passage already told us they were eating the Passover ready to go already. I see, I don't know how scholars miss that kind of thing. They still had one more thing to do, though. Uh, see, they were taken advantage of in slavery, uh, not being paid proper wages for their work, of course. So, let's read. First, the Egyptians, verse 33, wanted Israel gone, right? Uh, they said, get out, because they were afraid more death would come their way. Uh, they were afraid of what Yahuwah would do next uh, if, if they didn't, right, uh, push Israel out right away. So it wasn't just go. It was go now. Go, go, get out. Go, 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 go. What? You want gold? Here, take, have it. Here, take it. Go. <laughs> Verse 34, the people took their dough, they prepared, and it was unleavened, see, already. Um, verse 35, Israel then asked the Egyptians for basically compensation, uh, really for lost wages and slavery all of those years, and a right that they should have. In fact, every culture that has been enslaved by colonialists should be able to do the same, really. Come on, that's just the right thing. Uh, anything else would be evil. And the Egyptians gave them jewels, gold, silver, etc. Uh, see, Egypt just lost this battle uh, with Yahuwah, and these are even considered the spoils of war, in essence, uh, that were given to them, really very customary uh, in cultures of that age. So not a surprise to see that. Uh, some look at that and say, well, why would they do that? No, they wanted them gone. They wanted them out. No, I don't want any of my other children to die. Please take the gold. Go. Okay, that's where we are. They were uh, making haste. They were 
anxious to get rid of the Israelites, and Israel was anxious to go. So understand, that's the buildup to all of this. So Israel left Egypt, and the Exodus is underway. About 600,000 men, the passage says, with women and children. You've got to count them all. So likely, I don't know, something like 2 million people or more. That's just a ballpark off the top of my head, but it was something like that. Among them were non-Israelites, Gentiles. Understand that. That was always the dynamic in play there. Gentiles, a stranger that lived among them, uh, who would become subject to the same law, one law for the Gentiles and those who were native-born under the same covenant. Those saying that that only comes with the New Testament have never read the Bible and are clueless. And unfortunately, many of those are pastors. Just no other nations did so as a nation, uh, formed covenant, uh, and that is what separated Israel, not any one singular person. They continued to bake unleavened bread here in this passage because, well, that began the night before, remember, and this daytime after Passover, well, it's still the first day of unleavened bread. They're practicing it right there. Whether Pharisees ever understand that or not is completely impertinent. Uh, who cares? When was this? Well, they didn't sit around all day twiddling their thumbs just waiting for the lunar day to change at sundown. That's ridiculous. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, that's for certain. Uh, the Bible is very clear on this. That calendar fails on everything, really, that we've ever tested, and it is much. Notice they were thrust out of Egypt in haste. They could not tarry. See, they weren't welcome anymore, obviously, and they didn't want to be there anyway, so all good. Uh, and that is a good thing. But it means they didn't just sit around all day just waiting for the sun to go down. So the next day began uh, on the lunar calendar from Babylon, which they did not follow. And the Bible doesn't follow. The Passover is the night before and a night to be observed in remembrance of Yahuwah bringing Israel out of Egypt. But that didn't actually occur physically that night but not until the next day after sunrise. Uh, whether they left in some dark hours or not doesn't really matter. Uh, it would have been in waves. That's a lot, a lot of people to move, and it would have taken all day for them to get in gear. Uh, but what they wouldn't have done is just sat around waiting. They left. Uh, the exodus did not occur at night. Uh, they prepared then, that's for sure. Uh, a lot happened, and we've, you can see you know, all, thing, all these things going on. Uh, but it was the self-same day. Now, the day changes at sunrise. So what does that mean? It's easy. The first day of unleavened bread. That day. The feast day. It's pretty simple. Uh, so it was after sunrise when Israel left Egypt. Uh, the same feast Sabbath day. The same feast day. But that doesn't change the Bible calendar, which begins at sunrise. It reinforces it, actually. Uh, the night was already spent preparing, and they were ready. Uh, it took time for Moses to be called to the palace in the dark hours of the morning. Uh, then Israel went to their Egyptian neighbors, asking for gifts for their journey. And then they left, again, two million of them roughly. Uh, it would be about sunrise, no matter how you shake it, logically. But not after that, because they were making haste. Exodus 23, 15 and 34, 18 confirm that it is during unleavened bread, it doesn't say Passover, uh, but during unleavened bread that Israel came out of Egypt. And that's because it wasn't during the dark hours of Passover, it was the next day during daylight unleavened bread, which is when people travel in that era, not typically at night. In our video, Unleavening the Seven Days of Unleavened Bread, or Removing the Leaven from the Seven Days of Unleavened Bread, we lay out this timeline for these seven days. Uh, and one observes uh, it begins with Passover at sundown on the 14th, because it says it begins at sundown on the 14th, just like Passover does. Uh, and then you count to the 21st at sundown for a total of seven days. It works out perfectly. But 
not on a lunar calendar. This only works on a solar calendar, never the moon. Uh, how do we know? Well, the date changes at sunrise each day, uh, not at sunset, or you have to add to this uh, an extra half a day or day in order to make it work, and it just plain doesn't. Uh, and see, that's what the Jews do, uh, the rabbis, uh, because they follow the Babylonian lunar calendar, not the Bible one, which is based on the sun, never the moon, for these measures. Yes, the moon has a purpose. The moon is wonderful. The moon is good. The moon is not wicked, but its purpose is not to replace the sun. Watch when does the Bible day begin? We prove that. And here we see scripture is clear on this in Numbers 33, 3. And they departed from Ramses, okay, so Ramses uh, and Goshen, if you look at them on a map, they can leave there and cross on land. They didn't cross the Red Sea at that point. Uh, there was no Suez Canal built yet, and there was a lot of land to cross there. Uh, the Red Sea crossing is on the other side. Uh, they crossed the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia very clearly in every passage. So they departed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. Hello, the 15th day, not the 14th. If you follow the lunar Babylonian calendar of the Jews, that would be the next night. So they did twiddle their thumbs all day with nothing to do. Uh, that doesn't work. On the morrow after the Passover, that word morrow actually is the word boker, which is the word for morning, which is the word for tomorrow, which is the start of the day. It's the word for sunrise. It's the end of the period of boker, which is the dark hours of the morning, very clearly. You know, this has never been up for debate, and why almost all scholars can't read uh, it's their problem. It's not ours, all right? I mean, we're not here to answer for why they can't understand this. You and I can uh, and will. This seven days with its dates firms up that the Bible day begins at sunrise period, that's for sure, and really lays out these seven days of unleavened bread include the Passover. Uh, they're not separate, even though they are two, you know, separated feasts. Uh, and that's because Passover is so important, no doubt. But it's also because unleavened bread is, no doubt. And this is the part that many miss. For look what's happening here. The exodus from Egypt occurred on the first day of unleavened bread during the daytime. And it's not the only event. Let's chart this. One last dynamic here before we chart, though, uh, Jubilees 48, 15, and 16. Here we find out that it is, in fact, Satan who had the ear of Pharaoh all along. And that's the only thing that makes sense, if you really think this out. Yes, himself, Satan, and he is the enemy here behind the scenes driving everything on Pharaoh's side. Why did Pharaoh have a change of heart all of a sudden here? Well, here's how. And why does he change his heart back to attacking Israel five days later? And it was five days later. Same reason. Get this. And on the 14th day, that's the first day of unleavened bread, the first half, Passover in the evening, right? And on the 15th, that's the second half, first day of unleavened bread during the daytime. And on the 16th and on the 17th and on the 18th, okay? So there's five full days the Prince of Mastema, now we cover the word in Answers and Jubilees, uh, watch uh, who was Mastema, uh, or was Mastema Satan, I think is the actual title. That is Satan, no one else, and that's indisputable, just watch that and you'll see, we do prove that out. He was bound and imprisoned behind the children of Israel that he might not accuse them, so he couldn't do anything. That is what was going on this entire time, and now this makes sense. Why Pharaoh really defies reason, you know, in such ways, it, it really, it doesn't make sense any other way, really. But Jubilees explains it. So five days, Satan is bound, and during that time, Israel's let go. Pharaoh's heart was changed during that time. In fact, even the Egyptians uh, gave gifts to Israel as it was leaving as Israel asked for, and they gave them gold, silver, uh, and, and jewels. Wow. Pharaoh even asked Moses for a blessing. That's what it says in the passage. Read it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. 
Uh, talk about a change of heart. It's as if it's a different story. And that's why Sancton was bound during that time. So things started to go in a little more logical, reasonable direction. And then Israel uh, got a good distance ahead into the wilderness, uh, g gave them a head start. Uh, the wilderness called the Sinai Peninsula today, uh, that's where they were during that time. And on the 19th, we let them loose that they might help the Egyptians and pursue the children of Israel. There you go. This was a setup. And for the last time in this narrative, Egypt will be decimated. And by the way, there is actual historic record of that indisputably. We, we want to cover that in time. We, we do have it in one of the upcoming books, uh, but we, we'll get there in video form. So yes, this really happened. By the way, anyone reading the last chapter of Jubilees, I, we get this from time to time, uh, there's a very clear corruption there uh, from the Ethiopic uh, in R.H. Charles. We didn't change it because we don't have the Hebrew to change it with, so we, we didn't do that, okay? We left this text alone in that regard. We did uh, mention things in margin notes, but we didn't touch this. But we would disagree uh, with other poor, or this would disagree with other portions of Jubilees if you, if it was not a corruption. It must be a corruption, uh, and it would also disagree with Torah. But Torah also has passages that can be taken out of context or sort of read in this direction too, and just need to be uh, reconciled. This should be no surprise, and we find the same in Genesis, so no, that does not discount the entire book as Torah, uh, as it proves to be. It just doesn't work that way. What a false paradigm. Uh, however, very clearly, uh, where it says the 15th, it has to be the 14th of Abib, as the Passover lamb is to be eaten by sunrise, not all day into the next day. It doesn't work. Uh, there are other passages, even in Torah, uh, where one could attempt the same, yet Scripture is very clear that's the case, uh, and Jubilees is, as well in other passages. They just can't say that. Uh, in this age, we reconcile these kinds of net straining supposed discrepancies. We don't throw them out. Uh, we don't throw out the entire book as a result, of course. That's not logic. Uh, now, let's chart the Exodus beginning. This is incredibly, uh, especially specific here when we look at Isaac's timeline, uh, which we have covered during this same time. Same dates and Messiahs, which we'll show you. Uh, we have also covered and charted before, but we'll, get, we'll go to that too. Hold on to your seats. This is going to be really good. So the 14th of Abib, April 4th this year for us and the Reconcile uh calendar that we use. Uh, while Satan is bound, remember, is the start of unleavened bread, a feast Sabbath. The first half of it uh, is Passover, which includes unleavened bread, the same, uh, but the first half of the day, first half of the first day of unleavened bread. They partake of the Passover, spreading its blood on the doorpost. Then at midnight comes the angel of death. Pharaoh mourns uh, at at night, in the middle of the night. Uh, he calls Moses and Aaron to the palace in the middle of the night, uh, after this is all happening after midnight. Uh, and then Israel's freed, but first they go to the Egyptians requesting uh, payback, really, uh, in gifts. They are really owed for all the work they did in slavery without payment. Uh, remember, Israel was already preparing. Uh, they did not wait for Pharaoh to let them go to begin preparations. That would be wrong. I mean, that's what the passage says. Uh, they knew this was it. They were leaving, and they were getting ready before. Then the sun rises, and the 15th of Abib begins, as the Bible calendar is not up for debate, at sunrise. Passover ends at sunrise, and the date changes to the 15th. Uh, even according to Numbers 33.3, which we just read, uh, and others, uh, we cover in mass in uh, the series, When Does the Bible Day Begin? 
That is not a mystery. And for those saying, uh, but the creation clock says it was evening, it was morning. Stop right there and go back and read. Uh, you just missed the entire daytime, which Yahuwah labels daytime. He created light and called it day, um, the first day. Uh, I, I don't know how you just missed a 12 hour period and claimed to represent the Bible. Uh, but. Again, those you've listened to, they aren't actually scholars when they do something so dumb, because that's really bad. Uh, then they claim, you know, the day start uh, at night, which is nonsense, uh, and that light was created at night. That's nonsense uh, in the evening. No, it didn't start there. That's the end of the day, not the start of the day. Uh, creation began at sunrise. Watch our creation series. Uh, we covered that well there, uh, as well as uh, When Does the Bible uh, Day Begin uh, series as well. Uh, again, days in this feast, feast days, cannot change the Bible calendar day, uh, and they do not, as the dates here affirm, the date changes at sunrise each day, period. That's the way it works. Israel now leaves Egypt, and uh, on this 15th day of Abib, during the daytime. This is where we are right now. During the daytime of this day, this happened. Wow. Oh, it's not the only thing. We're going to get there. Still the first day, the second half, of unleavened bread, the forgotten period by the Pharisees and most scholars, because, well, they use the Babylonian occult lunar calendar and they lose the word when they do so because it's not Yahuwah's. He established his calendar at creation. And yes, it matters. And for this full day, Satan is still bound in Egypt. Remember that. Unleavened bread continues, and Satan is still bound uh, the 16th, 17th, and 18th. And that's why, oh, that's three days and nights. Mm, wonder why. We'll get there. Wait till we get to Messiah's timeline. Hmm. Then on the 19th, Pharaoh changes his mind. Why? Satan is released then, and he prefers, as many scholars uh, do, unfortunately, to listen to Satan over Yahuwah. That's what they're doing when they're not following the word. Sorry, but that's just the truth, and that's what we cover here. Uh, we've proven that many times over, and we'll always rebuke them for doing so. Uh, that is our role, biblically. Uh, we don't care if that offends them. Uh, we hope it does, uh, as the truth of the word offends, and that's showing love, my friends. We should all do so. Now, he came to divide households, Messiah did. He said, uh, even, you know, father against son, mother against, you know, uh, mother against father. I, I mean, that's the way Yahushua said it was going to work because division was going to be uh, the lay of the land through his second coming. And it's his second coming that will be united. But the world will not be united under him. It will be united under the beast, and even then, it won't ever truly unite. Uh, but certainly, uh, those that oppose him, uh, who take the mark of the beast, uh, will war with him in the end. So, not sure how the modern church thinks representing the opposite paradigm of Yahuwah, uh, and then calling that love inappropriately, uh, missing rebuke uh, happens, but you know, there are many who will defend that. This is, again, a channel for the mature who can understand that rebuke geared towards scholars, not you even, uh, is what we should do. Uh, if you're following their teachings, uh, sometimes we all have, understand that. We used to teach their junk too, and until we tested it, and it fails. This is why we are on a crusade here, to restore the word, as we all should. And man, it is so needed in this age of strong delusion. Now look how this also matches up, though, with Isaac's sacrifice. Let's go there. We cover the details of these dates from Jubilees and Isaac's sacrifice with the scriptures, uh, a video everyone should review. We're not going to go through that whole account here. Uh, someone tried to debate it the, just the other day, I think it was, and they were saying, well, we'll see, you didn't even notice that, uh, you know, it was only three days and that, that doesn't work out in your timeline. And they forgot that the day that Satan came to accuse Abraham to Yahuwah, uh, <laughs> 
uh, happened, you know, long before that, and that's when the start counted, uh, when the count started, and, and they forgot that, and then they started it on the day Abraham left and, and just totally screwed it up because they thought that was the day Abraham left, and it says that he left the next day. So they're off by one, and, and we get that kind of thing all the time. Uh, but, of course, uh, they come in yelling at us uh, at, at, you know, blasphemy or whatever, and uh, you got to be kidding. Uh, what we what we taught was accurate and remains so. Messiah didn't follow the timeline of the Passover lamb either. Many bring that up. He followed the covenant timeline set in the sacrifice to be of Isaac, the son of covenant. Isaac was offered. Of course, the angel stopped Abraham. But Abraham, in his heart, placed Yahuwah above his own son. This is exactly what Yahushua is repeating in timeline, not the Passover lamb in that sense. It's about the covenant. And this day is the daylight hours of the day after Passover, which begins at sunrise on Abib 15. Boom. Just at the same time when Israel started the Exodus. Yes, another account of many, which also prove the Bible day begins at sunrise. Uh, and what about Yahusha? Let's look at his timeline and see. We cover this in our Sabbath series, parts 6b and c, with tons of scripture, and then we chart it. Uh, Yahusha had a Passover meal, according to the abundant scripture, across the Gospels. Again, we cover those. Go watch it. Uh, the disciples acquired the Passover lamb. Uh, they prepared it in the passage. That's what it says. And then they ate. They had dinner, and yes, he, Yahusha, ate. It says two. Uh, there you go. And that's before the communion. Hmm. So he ate the meal with them. I know there are illiterates out there uh, who will really double down on something like this and say, well, but that doesn't mean that he actually ate the Passover lamb. Well, maybe he ate something else. Duh. The passage says he ate dinner first and it was the Passover uh, and lamb was the main course, period, as they purchased it, prepared it, or they, they got it, whether it was purchased or not. It, it was ready to eat. He ate with the disciples and then offered the communion, as we call it, uh, with the bread and wine toward the end of the meal uh, that he ate the meal. <laughs> uh, it, duh. I mean, I, it's, it, I, it's as if they can't read at all. Uh, not before, and that was not the meal replacing the Passover. It was the Passover. That's what it says. Uh, and no, this could not be any other day, period. It would not work. He was not crucified with the Passover lamb. That's nonsense. He was with Isaac's sacrifice. They ate the lamb, which is the next day during the daytime after Passover Still the first day of unleavened bread during the daytime. They ate the lamb they prepared, and a scholar could not be more inept than to not realize that. I mean, it's so obvious. And to play those games, oh, but maybe he didn't eat the lamb. I mean, come on. Don't be a child. How about that? Now, it's just so obvious. Uh, it requires profound illiteracy to say otherwise. But here we go. Messiah was in the tomb then, uh, technically dead, for exactly three days and three nights. Because, see, that's what he said. He didn't say four days, did he? No, he didn't. And whether we completely figure that out or someone else does or whatever, that is the fact of Scripture. Clearly, the night of his death is not being counted, period, regardless why. And we do cover that as well. Uh, he then rose on the weekly Sabbath before sunrise. That's what the Bible says over and over again throughout the Gospels. And even Peter learned on the first day of the week, later that morning, after sunrise, which he had risen before sunrise, which was the previous day, the Sabbath, the seventh day. But now it's the first day, right? And later that day, in the evening, it's still called the first day of the week week after sundown, which means in the Bible, the day doesn't change at sundown, period. There's no other way to view that. Uh, but what was going on in Egypt during this time? Well, let's take a comparison of the three here in one, and this, this will show you everything. Wow. 
Now, this is so awesome. Uh, so we've combined all three timelines into one here, so uh, we can all see this clearly. The 14th of Abib, which again, this year is April 4th, 2023, uh, on our calendar uh, that we're following. Again, not perfect, and it's okay if you have a different one. Uh, we're not saying this is the perfect calendar yet. Uh, it's a Tuesday on the Bible calendar, and that is fixed, uh, set and fixed. You can't change that part. Uh, that night was the Passover in which Israel ate with the travel clothes on, ready to go, right? Uh, Satan is bound, remember that, uh, during that time. Uh, that is the same night that Yahusha ate the same Passover and later was captured, tried, and found guilty by the Pharisees, not the Romans. Uh, understand that. Uh, essentially, we have an antithesis uh, going on here in parallel, and this is amazing. Very awesome. Uh, then the sun rises, Passover ends, but it is still the second half of the first day of unleavened bread, the daytime period of that 24 hours. Uh, one of the most important days in all of history. Look at this. The Exodus begins then, and Israel leaves Egypt that day during the daytime. Satan is still bound. Remember, Yahushua is crucified that same day during the daytime. Yes, the sun was out, and it was day in order for it to be darkened. In fact, they give the hours, even the third hour, the ninth hour, so on and so forth. It's, it's, you, you can't mess it up. Uh, and most scholars understand that that was during the day, uh, yet you can't follow a lunar calendar if you do that. I mean, you just threw it out. You, there's no way. But they still try to find ways to make that uh, kind of fit, but it never does. There's no logic to him being crucified on Passover uh, itself, which is an evening event, and that just is nonsense. Uh, he would not because at the bottom on the 15th, uh, that is the same time frame that Isaac was to be sacrificed. This all fits with brilliance right there in Scripture for all to see. Wow. Now, Messiah is dead for three days and three nights, as he said, and notice that was the same time frame. Satan was still bound for a total of five days in Egypt. Wow. Uh, Yahushua resurrected uh, just before the sun rises on the 18th still, at the very, very end, the very last tip of it, uh, but still Saturday or the seventh day uh, on the Bible calendar. And again, Satan was still bound in Egypt. Uh, at that point. Yahushua is already risen then on the first day of the week, uh, Sunday, okay? So there's, I mean, you can celebrate something on Sunday, but that's not when he rose. Uh, yeah, on the Roman calendar, it would have been the early hours, but if your church is meeting before 6 a.m., cool. But if it's not, don't play games and claim that you're in any way following the Sabbath. You are not. Uh, so Sunday, the 19th of Abib, that is the day Satan was loosed, and Egypt pursues the Israelites. There you go. Uh, and again, Yahushua already risen at that point. This is a match, and really in an antithesis, uh, if, you, if you were. But nevertheless, this is amazing stuff. Wow. And all in this period. Amazing. Now let's go to the New Testament, Mark 14, 1, where, well, we're seeing unleavened bread mentioned here. What's going on? The Pharisees had decided they wanted to put Yahushua to death, not the Romans, by the way, uh, but they had a dilemma. They couldn't put him to death on a feast day. Hmm. Well, how can they get away with that when they did do it on a feast day? Hmm. I don't understand, right? Ah, it's actually very simple. Two different calendars at play. See, they said the people would revolt if they did it on a feast day. But remember, they were in charge of the religious system of Israel. So they had already conditioned people to their lunar calendar, their false uh, feasts, where they have a gap during this period. See, they have a gap to exploit. Uh, but it's not really a gap, not on the Bible calendar, uh, which continues, and it's this period that we're in right now. So what did they do? Well, they had him killed on what the Bible calls the first day of unleavened bread, but on their calendar is a gray area where they're waiting for their feast, Sabbath, to begin, 
in ignorance. Uh, complete fraud, really, in a calendar from Babylon. Yes, they were keeping that then even, and this proves that. Uh, they did crucify him on the feast day on the Bible clock. But see, not on theirs. See, and that's that's what, oh, we, we didn't do it. And of course, they'll also say, we, we did crucify him, the Romans did. Uh, you're the ones that captured him, found him guilty, and paraded him to Pilate and to Herod and back to Pilate and pushed Pilate, who washed his hands of the whole thing, said Messiah wasn't guilty of anything, gave you a choice even, and you chose the criminal uh, over the son of Yahuwah. Yeah, you did it. Let's be clear. Uh, that's just not how it works. But that's standard Pharisee language. See, they always try to do that in ways that they play games. And this is why we're warned about the leaven of the Pharisees. And that's what the seven days is about, is unleavening, removing the leaven from our lives of these illiterate Pharisees that don't represent scripture in the slightest. And unfortunately, they've infiltrated our churches. Notice this unholy week, as the Catholic Church calls it. Oh, no, that's right. They don't call it that. But they really should, <laughs> because that's what it is, uh, is based around this uh, concept called Easter, uh, e Easter right? The, the uh, fertility goddess holiday of bunnies and eggs. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that, that's got an ancient precedence before the Catholic Church even existed, uh, yet they picked up another occult holiday and rebranded as the resurrection when we have that in the Passover. But here you have utter fraud right here from the Catholic Church uh, where they took the word Pasha, which is Passover, uh, always interpreted that way in the Greek, 28 of 29 times that it's used in the Greek New Testament. Yet here, what do we see in Acts 12, 4? Easter. What? The word's Pasha. See, it's on screen. Uh, and that's not Easter. That's Passover. This is a lie. Uh, inserted purposely by the Catholic Church in fraud and never corrected, not even by the Protestant Church to this day in most translations. It is disgusting. Uh, that's the paradigm that we're exposing here. Now, also notice here, Peter kept unleavened bread, not Easter, uh, and Herod, in fact, did the same. He didn't keep Easter. He kept unleavened bread because his family converted to the religion of Israel before. No, it doesn't make him a good person. Uh, he certainly was evil. He had his issues, but he did keep the feasts of the Pharisees, which are all profaned anyway. But wait a minute. Does this mean the apostles kept the feast after Yahushua ascended to heaven? Hmm. Did they not know what supposedly the Catholic Church does that uh, Yahushua changed the Sabbath and feasts and, and abandoned them, abolished them? Uh, well, no, not in a single scripture anywhere ever. And the ones taking Paul out of context, oh, give me a break. They all need to be corrected. It's terrible. In Acts 20, 6 and 7, it demonstrates here uh, Luke writing the book of Acts, uh, that Paul is still keeping the feasts of Yahuwah after Yahuwah's ascension. And by the way, 85 Sabbath observances are recorded in the book of Acts alone. It is ludicrous to say they passed away when they did not in Scripture. Here's what Luke wrote of Paul. Yep, Luke and uh, Timothy's mentioned here and a whole group here with Paul, in fact. Uh, go back and read the list. It's there in, in the former passage, the previous passage. Uh, and we sailed away, we, right, sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Yeah, why would that even matter if it passed away? Well, it wouldn't, number one. And the language here is not accurate either. This has been manipulated. Uh, and we'll show you. And came unto them to Troas, uh, Tro Troas, however you say that, in five days, uh, where we abode seven days. Why seven days? See, here's another corruption and fraud, really. Uh, this is not after the seven days of unleavened bread. It is the seven days of unleavened bread. During it, that's the timeline. It's very well established here, and I'll show you how. Uh, we can see that, a telltale sign in this passage, that it's been manipulated. 
And upon the first day of the week, no, not Sunday, stop, stop, stop. This is unleavened bread. It's the first day of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. That's what this is. How do we know? I'll show you. Uh, that is a week or seven day period, and that is the observance here. It is a week, uh, the week of unleavened bread, not the normal week week. Uh, so it's not Sunday. This is actually Tuesday. Uh, when the disciples came together to break bread. What are they breaking bread on? Not Sunday. This is on the Passover, Tuesday. And unleavened bread, which begins at the same time, which is the origin of the communion. That's what this is all about. Let's fix this passage. Paul preached unto them. Maybe we'll do this in more depth at some point, but I wanted to cover this in this video because it's something that we've been seeing for a while now and we wanted to point out. So Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. What's that? At sunrise. Now, and continued his speech until midnight. Okay, those are two key markers there within the seven-day period, which proves it's unleavened bread and Passover. Uh, wait, uh, why midnight? Oh, wait, 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 wait. We covered that, right? Because that is the Passover unleavened bread timeline. What happened at midnight? The angel of death came to Egypt. See, uh, I bet if we were given the actual complete timeline uh, that is actually uh, when Messiah was captured uh, in hours uh, as well as found guilty, one or the other, it would, it would have been one of those two things, is probably when he was found guilty or probably when he was captured at midnight. Uh, very likely. It certainly was after dinner. It was late. Uh, we, we, don't, we aren't given the exact hour, so... Uh, we don't have to know that, though, but that's an educated guess, very likely. This, has never a, this is never a scripture uh, about Sunday. This is Tuesday, Tuesday night, Passover. That's what this is about, right there in Acts. And it's not the only time Paul talks about Passover. He talks about unleavened bread. Oh, don't believe me? Let's go there and see, and we'll end here. I know, Paul hated the law and the feasts and Sabbath, right? not even remotely. He taught them, as well as all Ten Commandments, and he kept the feast and the Sabbath uh, and the law. And the church has committed the worst fraud in history, reading Paul in fragments out of context, claiming that, well, he's a hypocrite. That's how they're really characterizing him, because he kept the feasts and Sabbath, so he can't preach against them. Uh, so they're doing so falsely, uh, basically breaking a commandment, they're bearing false witness, uh, against their neighbor. Paul is their neighbor. He was an apostle. We proved that too. Watch Was Paul an Apostle? Watch also What Did Paul Say series, uh, where we deal with this in more detail. Uh, and it gets pretty, pretty down into detail, but man, is it good. Uh, they were doing so 2,000 years ago. This isn't even new. According to 2 Peter 3, Peter says so when he endorses Paul's epistles even. How about that? Now, uh, the foundation of most churches in doctrine really comes from that 2,000 years ago. A bunch of fragments uh, from Paul out of context. It's really lousy what they do. And again, if you watch that series, we, we demonstrate some enough to make the point, and that's really all we wanted to do. So we ended the series, but we could have gone on and on and on because Paul wrote a lot. Not only did Paul say the law is holy, good, and just— uh, do we abolish the law? Heaven forbid, he said. Hmm. I mean, how do we not see that there, scholars? Uh, can they read it all? Uh, you you got to wonder, because uh, the modern church is missing this, and it's really, really poor. But here, in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, Therefore, let us keep the feast. What feast? What is he talking about? Ah, even though we know which one here, because he's specific to unleavened bread and Passover, essentially. Uh, these didn't pass away in Paul's time, so why is the church replacing them today with occult festivals? It's called hypocrisy, that's what it is, and there's no way to reconcile that, you just can't. Not with old leaven, no, he's not talking about the Old Testament, he's talking about Pharisee leaven, as he says many times. Neither with a leaven of malice and wickedness. Are you kidding? Are you really going to say, scholar, that Moses was full of leaven of malice and wickedness? Oh, that is idiotic. You've got to be kidding. You don't call yourself a Bible scholar when you say things like that, right? 
Now, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, okay? Unleavened. And that's what Messiah represented, right? That was his message, sincerity and truth, as well as Paul's, all the apostles, and the entire Bible is unleavened in that sense. Uh, by leavening, what do you do? You add to it. You, you, uh, you're adding yeast, and yeast makes it expand. And that's what you're doing to the word. That's what Pharisees do, especially. But Paul said what? Keep the feast. That's pretty settled. Now, we didn't create a, another Passover video because we have several where we've covered the Passover, but we did have a post on that. Uh, if you saw our Facebook or our YouTube posting, uh, if you haven't looked for that, it's there. Uh, but for the upcoming feast for the rest of this year, 2023, uh, which is where we are at the time of this video, uh, we're in the seven days of unleavened bread right now uh, as of the release of this video. Uh, the first fruit offering takes place on Abib 26. That's a fixed date every year. Uh, we find that in the Qumran calendars uh, mul multiple years, in fact. So it's not actually a question. Uh, it doesn't require a calculation. Uh, it was calculated long ago by Moses, and it's been there for all of us to see. Uh, same as Shavuot, by the way. I know there's a counting there in Scripture, but the counting was already done. That was already executed, and it's a fixed day, the third month. Uh, they call Sivan on the 15th day period. It's fixed. It's never the 6th, uh, which is a fiction of a uh, Pharisee uh, from uh, the first few centuries there, uh, where he just made it up and said, well, everybody knows. Uh, he didn't, that's for sure. So why, why does anybody listen to him? Well, no one should. Uh, watch our video, though, here, uh, the uh, 2023 feast calendar, where we explain each feast in some basics and all the dates. Uh, and how to read basically the, the flyer that we created uh, that you can download that uh, calendar free uh, from the description box link uh, or the bottom of our homepage uh, of our website, thegodculture.com. Also the full calendar uh, of Zadok Way, uh, their Qumran calendar. Uh, we have a link that you can go to them and download their full calendar for the year. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but, uh, but theirs is pretty good and of what we've seen uh, one of the better out there. We haven't committed to another because we, we like theirs. We like the basis uh, in the Qumran uh, calendars. That's important. As Paul said, though, keep the feast, my friends. Yes, there is much confusion out there, no doubt about that. And we're doing our best to cut through it uh, and prove all things. Most importantly, though, no matter what calendar you use or what directions uh, you are convicted to follow, Keep the feast, for that is what is most important. Yah bless to everyone.